to get started, I want to know what sparked your interest in public service, whether it's the local or state level? Well, I've been involved with different sort of actions and activism my whole life, um, even when I was younger and as a, as a child. But when I went to college, I started interning for a member of Congress. And that sort of opened my eyes to how we could take issues of fairness and social justice and put them together with public service. Um, after I graduated from college, I got what I thought was the best job offer a person could get, which was to open a district office for this member of Congress in a new part of New York City that he was beginning to represent. And that area and neighborhood was Greenwich Village. And for me, as a person right out of college, that was a dream job, to be able to work in a neighborhood known for its history of community activism, um, political activity, social justice. Um, but soon after I accepted that job and started working there, something sad and disturbing started to happen. We started to see constituents um, dying, and we didn't know why. Um, signs would go up on storefronts that would say, closed due to illness, and then they'd be replaced with out of business, death in the family. And we started to see the beginning of the AIDS epidemic start to hit Greenwich Village. And at that point, I was in my early 20s. Um, I was working for a member of Congress who was very concerned and very responsive to his constituents. And so I became very, very involved with trying to get the federal government to respond to the constituents' needs around the AIDS epidemic. And it was at that point that I sort of immersed myself, really, in all aspects of the HIV epidemic, education, prevention, treatment, community activism. Um, and I realized that the AIDS epidemic for me at the time wasn't only about a virus, and it wasn't only about um, the medical piece. It was really bigger than that. It was around the intersectionality of the, what the virus represented. It was about how people who had met, um, financial resources were able to get access to care, and those who didn't weren't. Um, it was about how we treated each other. And most of all, it was about how we cared for each other as a community. And that was sort of the point at which I decided I wanted to continue to be in public service, not elected public service, but public service. And um, I spent the next 10 or 15 years involved in the HIV epidemic, particularly working with vulnerable populations, particularly people who were in drug and alcohol treatment and in jail, making sure they had information, tools, skills, access to treatment. Um, and then worked at the Amherst Survival Center for five years um, as the executive director, helping, you know, making sure that we were supporting our neighbors to access basic needs. And then, series of circumstances decided to run for political office. So my public service was really not as an elected official for a very long time. It was both as a congressional aide, as an activist, as a coalition builder, um, but then eventually came around to this. Did you help to kind of destigmatize uh, the HIV epidemic in a way that maybe transitioned into your work around the LGBT community today? Yes, I hope I, I hope I did that. I hope I helped to destigmatize it in lots of different ways because what the HIV epidemic revealed was it wasn't only HIV that was stigmatizing. It's the people who were being infected by it and affected by it that were also sort of being pushed to the side and marginalized. And it definitely was a result of, I mean, I was already sort of um, involved with the LGBT um, civil rights movement um, in the 1980s, which is a long way from 2020 in terms of what needed to ha be done. But absolutely, because the first population that we saw HIV sort of emerge were um, gay men, and we saw how the government was refusing to acknowledge that and take care of people and fund research and fund treatment and make sure that people had what they deserved and the, with the dignity that they deserved it, it definitely impacted me in that way. But it also impacted me in terms of people who use drugs and how we treat folks who do that and other kinds of populations. Absolutely. Um, I know I want to stay on that topic. I know you've done a lot of work with the LGBTQ mm -hmm. community. Um, what else can the state do to really be more gender inclusive? Well, there's a couple of different things. There's legislation actually in the legislature right now rep, um, introduced by a colleague of mine that would make sure that, for example, HIV prevention medicine was available to young adults. That's something that would be gender inclusive because it would say 
that regardless of who you love, regardless of how you love, regardless of how you put yourself, how um, you may be at risk, you're entitled to prevention medication and prevention information. Um, we could do more around equality, generally speaking, employment bias. Um, I have a couple of bills introduced this session that um, would make us more gender inclusive. One would make all state applications and forms have a non-binary option on them. So for people who don't identify as either male or female, they can still be represented on those forms. Another bill would allow public buildings to make gender inclusive bathrooms without needing special permission. So there's a lot of ways to uh, make sure that people feel seen, are seen, and that are also treated equally. Absolutely. I want to hear more about your advocacy work around the gun control. Mm -hmm. um, I know one of the bills you filed this session that we were talking about before, uh, did it get shot down? Did it mm -hmm. not pass? What is your work right now around gun control entail? Um, a colleague and I were thinking about doing a late file bill around gun safety and gun violence prevention which is still sort of in the mix, but we have not completely flushed it out. So it would, after you get sworn in, you have like, you know, two or three weeks to introduce legislation. And as a newly elected, sometimes it's like, oh, I want to do something on this topic, but I don't have the time to really flush it out right now. So you can kind of put in a placeholder. And we're still looking at that placeholder to see if we want to make it bigger. I'm also working on a different late file legislation that would make an excise tax on firearms and ammunition, and I'm hoping that that'll be introduced within the next week. So what can the state do to you know, protect residents from gun violence mm. almost immediately? Mm. Well, I think you know, gun violence is it's sort of like, um, it's very intersectional. It's a lot like the HIV epidemic. It's not just about the gun, although that's part of it. It's also about people's access to employment, people's access to community, to basic needs, to food, to family and to feel connected to each other. So I think the questions are really much bigger when it comes to gun violence prevention. Part of it is removing the weapon of violence and, and limiting access to that and being really careful about who has access to that. Um, but the other piece of it is what are all the social supports we need to bring in for communities who are at risk so that people don't turn to violence, so that there isn't um, a need for guns in those communities, you know, that we're addressing sort of whatever violent crime is happening. But that's a bigger issue than just guns and gun safety. That goes into community connectedness, that goes into education funding, social funding, funding for community centers so that people have a place to come and connect with each other so that we reconnect as a community and take care of each other. What would you have to say to those people that really oppose any type of gun restriction legislation? Um, I'd say that we have a problem. We have a major problem in our country. And one way to address that problem is through restrictions and limits. And that doesn't mean turning our back on the Constitution or an amendment on the Constitution, but that means addressing the year 2019. So for example, I'm not so sure that people have an automatic right to um, uh, the high capacity magazines that will allow them to murder hundreds of people very rapidly when we're not at war. Um, so I think, it's a, I think it's a bigger discussion. I certainly don't want to step on anybody's rights. Um, I'm a big believer in the US Constitution. I like all aspects of the Constitution. Um, but I don't think the Constitution is there to victimize us. I think the Constitution is there is to protect us. So I think it's a conversation to have. We have to have some limits. And thankfully in Massachusetts, we do. We're one of the safest states because of our restrictions. And people still have access um, to their Second Amendment rights. I'm going to segue a little bit and discuss your work around education funding. I know you've been a huge, huge advocate for education. <laughs> Uh, you have a big vote coming up. Mm. What do you anticipate happening around education funding this session? Oh, I am very excited and um, optimistic and, uh, did I mention excited? I think that what we're about to do in the House, we're taking this vote this week, I'm not sure when this will be shown, 
um, is probably one of the, the most, if not the most, significant vote I'll take this session, if not in my entire career, and hopefully I'll be here for a while. It's really be looking at the funding formula for schools in and at K through 12 in Massachusetts so that we are looking for educational equity and we're making sure that it, um, the kind of education you receive in Massachusetts isn't dictated by your zip code. It's dictated by the fact that you're a resident of Massachusetts and everybody's going to get sort of uh, the, the kinds of resources they need to succeed um, both in K through 12 and beyond. Um, and I'm excited because I think it also, it's a way of us expressing our commitment to public education that hopefully we can leverage after this vote into our commitment to public higher education and deal with colleges, universities, community colleges, student debt issues, all of those. Um, I'm really confident and optimistic that um, we're going to pass a terrific bill that's going to fund um, the kinds of things that we've needed to fund at a new level, at a current level, um, that we have not done for many years in the state. Um, the Senate's already taken their turn at it. Tomorrow is the House's turn. And I think everybody's just feeling like we're going to get this done. And it's a state legislature that's going to do it. What about the towns that do have the money to put into mm -hmm. education, mm -hmm. but the residents feel like they're being overtaxed? Mm -hmm. What would you say to them, maybe it's a 10-year, 15-year goal that either their taxes will go down or maybe a reduction in the size of the social safety net at a state level. Do you anticipate any of that happening? Um, I'm not so sure I anticipate a reduction of the a social safety net as a result of education funding. I think what I do anticipate is that we'll hopefully have an increase of students who are graduating from Massachusetts schools across the Commonwealth that have comparable skills that have received beneficial experiences while they were in school and that feel like their futures, um, that they have a path to their future, whether that's, whether that's a path through a community college, a university, a college, or not going to college at all, you know, going right into the workforce. Um, that they'll be able to kind of play a role in our economy in Massachusetts that's better and different than what it has been. That I hope will happen. The social safety net, though, is going to be based more on a whole lot of factors, education being just one of them. Early education is going to be a factor with that, right? Um, how we make childcare available to people will in fact allow us to know what other supports do people need. Food, access to food, access to housing, um, better tra public transportation in the state. As we, if we fund those services, I think then we will see a reduction in what we need to do for the safety net um, because we'll be facilitating people's access to the economy. The education is one piece of it, but I don't think it's the entire piece. I'm excited about this vote for education because it represents also a way that the House and the Senate can come to agreement on a very progressive bill and do the right thing together, and everybody is looking at this pretty much the same goal. There'll be amendments, and there'll be amendments withdrawn, amendments voted on. People will take different stands on amendments, but the core of this bill is what we have to be doing. And it's very progressive, so I'm excited. Absolutely, I have one last question for you. I know you make the commute from Amherst pretty frequently down here to Boston. How can your stitu constituents stay in touch with you and know your voting record and maybe even come for a visit? Oh, I'd love them to come for a visit. Well, there's lots of different ways. They can email me at mindy.dom, D-O-M-B, at mahouse.gov, and they'll have immediate contact with me if they have questions. Um, they can go on my website, which is www.repmindydom.com. Um, they can look me up on social media, which is actually probably the best way to get very timely information. You know, websites are sort of static, but social media, you kind of change every day. And I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Mindy4MA, M-I-N-D-Y-F-O-R-M-A. Um, I post my votes. Um, if they don't see a vote that they're interested in, they should let me know. I'm happy to share that, both on the committee level as well as in the chamber. Um, if they want to visit, they should email and say, when can I come and visit? If they want to keep in touch with me, they can sign up for my um, monthly electronic newsletter. And that's one way of at least getting sort of a picture of what I've done the month before. Um, so hopefully through social media, website, email, phone, um, they can also reach out at 413-461-2060.